This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media. This might be the most powerful lesson you could ever learn from, from Jesus when it comes to how to pray. Do you know what one of God's primary goals in your life is? Is to cut the lag time between when you get in trouble and when you kneel and start praying. He wants to cut the lag time between when you realize I'm in deep trouble and when you start to pray. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Vines. We are taking the gospel to the world. Pastor, apologist, and Bible teacher. One truth that will be delivered in love and compassion, connecting every one person to all that God has promised them. You make me want to dance and sing with every single breath I breathe. I will break this offering. You are my wonder. You bring the wonder. Today. 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 Today with Jeff Vines. Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining me again on Today with Jeff Vines. And we're back to finish this message about the Lord's Prayer. Pastor Jeff is helping us take a fresh look at this prayer, which for some of us has lost its depth and meaning. Let's continue now with Pastor Jeff as he digs deeper into the Lord's Prayer, looking at how we can live it out in our daily lives. This is Today with Jeff Vines. Now, in the Lord's Prayer, this is the only prayer recorded of Jesus praying. He ends it. He puts the bookends on it by saying, your Father is in heaven. He's over all things. And by the way, it's about His glory, His kingdom, and His power forever and ever. Now, let's keep going. It gets better. Let's say it again. Let's see if you have a little different vigor this time. Life is not about my kingdom. Number two, life is not about my power. Now, listen. Do you know what? This might be the most powerful lesson you could ever learn from, from Jesus when it comes to how to pray. Do you know what one of God's primary goals in your life is? Is to cut the lag time between when you get in trouble and when you kneel and start praying. He wants to cut the lag time between when you realize I'm in deep trouble and when you start to pray. Now, that's easy to do in a tragedy or crisis. I mean, when my daughter Sion was born, she had the cord around her neck, and I could tell the doctors were seriously concerned. I could tell the nurses were afraid she wasn't going to live, and I went down into the hospital on my knees immediately. There was no lag time, and I started begging God. Tragedy's easy, but what God wants is you to do the same thing in the little things of your life. He wants you to cut the lag time when things are falling apart at work and the time that you get on your knees and start asking God to get involved rather than taking the bull by the horn and trying to fix things yourself by gossiping and slandering and spreading rumors about the person who's causing you trouble or whining to the boss, rather than taking control and trying to solve it on your own, he wants to cut the lag time between when you know you're in trouble, when you pour out your heart to God and say, God, you got to fix this. And the only way he can do that is to start putting you in trouble again and again and again and see how long the lag time is. Now, this sermon is not about the story of Gideon, but because I've used the example so often, let's go back to the story of Gideon just for a moment. Remember what they had done. For seven years, they had denied God. They didn't honor him. It wasn't about his kingdom or his power. So God allowed the Midianites to come down and impoverish the Israelites. So for seven years, they were being defeated by the Midianites. And the Israelites didn't know what to do. They were outnumbered 135,000 to 32,000, which is better than a 13 to 1 odd. And they tried to run and hide in the holes and caves, but that didn't work because the Midianites said, well, we're not going to fight you. We'll just starve you out of existence. And so finally they prayed. So their lag time was seven years. It took them seven years to humble themselves and say, God, help us. And then when they prayed, God, help us, God came to Gideon and said, I'm going to deliver Midian into your hand, Gideon. And you remember what Gideon said? God basically says, all right, now that you've prayed and you've honored me, I'm ready Let's go take care of these pesky little Midianites. And Gideon's response was, well, they might be pesky, but they're not little. And it ticked God off. Because God said, what does it matter if they're little or big? And here's his response to Gideon in chapter, four, chapter 6, verse 14. The Lord turned to him and said, okay, this is sarcasm on God's part. You go ahead and go in your own strength. 
and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Do you hear what he's saying? He said, it's not, it's not your battle. Dude, it's not your battle. It's mine. So if I get involved, what makes you think it's about your power and how big or small they are? So can we just pause for a moment here? What battle are you facing? The Lord's Prayer is supposed to remind you, God cares. He's your father. Two, his kingdom is coming in your life whether you realize it right now or not. Three, he is holy and his decisions are righteous and pure even if you can't see them. You're not God. Do you think God owes you anything? Your very breath, your very life is given to you by him. So you approach God knowing and praying. Here's your prayer. Pray to God that you won't be tempted to leave him because you think he's not behaving in the way you think he should behave. His kingdom come. His will be done. Now, as you pray, cut the lag time. Cancer, the battle is the Lord's. Marriage conflict, the battle is the Lord's. Children gone astray, the battle is the Lord's. Financial disintegration, the battle is the Lord's. You say, Jeff, I don't even know what that means. Let me tell you what it means. It means no matter what happened or what extenuating circumstances occurred to get you in the place you are right now, that doesn't matter. What matters now is the only way out is the power of God. Which is why in James 5, 16, we're told in the old King James Version, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. What does that mean? The Greek here is beautiful. It means the strong prayer of a righteous man releases the divine energy of God. So this is not a weak prayer. This is the person who knows they have no hope in their own weakness other than their own weakness in humility to expect God to deliver his strong and effectual power. When you pray, the Bible tells you that God will release his divine energy, but you ain't God. So the way he releases energy may not be the way you want it. And the reason is hey, you're not God. You don't have his vantage point. And so when you pray, you're supposed to assume God knows what he's doing here. Does God have to go back and prove himself every time you get in trouble? Now, if you remember the story again of Gideon, what happens? God, re God reduces his army from 32,000 uh, to 300. And then he gives them this as their arsenal to defeat the Midianites. A trumpet and a clay jar. And Gideon's so frustrated. And again, why would God do that? Because God doesn't want Gideon or Israel to think they had anything to do with winning this victory. And if you've got 300 men against 135,000, that's better than a 451 odd. If you win, it's only because of God. Not because you bowed your neck, not because you got tough, but because you got weak. And you got on your knees and said, God, if you don't do this, it's not going to be done. And here's what I've learned in my own life. That God releases the power of the Holy Spirit through us and in us to the degree that we are totally, helplessly, and completely dependent on him. God will release the power of the Holy Spirit through us and in us to the degree that we are totally, helplessly, and completely dependent upon him. So if you want to go into battle half you and half God, you're going to be a disaster. But if you want to go into battle, believing the battle is God's, I'll tell you how this works. Stay with me. Something beautiful happens. Isaiah 31 says, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses and trust in the multitude of their chariots and in the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. The apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, now watch this carefully, those of you who think, those of you who think that you're battling something that is just so hard that it's only you and nobody else has to go through things like this. It's just you. The Apostle Paul said himself that in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. So there's something that's tormenting him that he can't quite overcome. He doesn't understand why he can't overcome it. He's praying that he would overcome it, but the message he gets from God is that I'm not going to take it away because I like how weak you are right now. Because in this weakness, he says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Here's what I've learned. With the supernatural calling of God comes the supernatural power of God to give you victory. Now, there's one thing still missing. 
With the supernatural calling of God comes the supernatural power of God to give you. When I mean calling, I mean whatever it is God's called you to endure. Whatever it is God's called you to go through in your life. With that will come the supernatural power of God. He's waiting on you to cut the lag time and mean it. You know what I mean by mean it? When you truly drop to your knees and you give it completely and fully and say, God, on the basis that you're my father and have my best interest in mind, on the basis that your kingdom is coming in this, even though I can't see it, on the basis that your will is holy and pure and you have a vantage point I don't have, on the basis that you don't owe me anything, but you've given me everything, I'm going to trust you. How many of you know this guy, the, the rock? This guy's a huge guy. You, you know who this is over here? The rock? Every time I see The Rock in a movie, I always think of that story John Ortberg told about this guy named Mongo, who was a bodybuilder, a kind of bouncer down at, uh, in L.A. And Ortberg said he was downtown uh, late at night, too late in a bad part of L.A., and he was just visiting with some friends, and he realized they had stayed too late, and they walked out, and it, Ortberg, who's a pastor, kind of a, kind of a you know, weenie-looking dude, you know what I mean? Kind of, it is what it is. I, I met him once and I thought, dude, you are weeny looking. But anyway, <laughs> he's not a man's man. You know what I mean? So you look at this guy. He says he, he came out and he, and he saw these two guys fighting and he looks over and he says, uh, and you know, he, he's a pastor, so he doesn't really want to get involved, but he doesn't want, he, his conviction is he has to stop these two guys from beating this other guy half to death. So he just looks at him without thinking. He says, you guys stop that. Now, can you imagine some pastor? Stop it. Don't do that to these thugs, you know. And he said, suddenly these guys looked at him, eyes got big, and they ran away. And Ober said, man, he gave me incredible courage. I said, and don't come back. <laughs> and he said, then I turned around, and I bumped into Mongo. It wasn't me they were afraid of. They were afraid of Mongo. And every time I remember that story, you know, what, how much courage would you have if Mongo was always behind you? wherever you went. I mean, you would do things you ordinarily wouldn't do because you'd, there's, there'd be a sense of fearlessness in you, wouldn't there? But the, the point is, God is always with you, and Mongo is nothing compared to God. And if you truly believed it wasn't about your kingdom and not about your power, you would take a lot more risk than you do. And once you heard the calling of God on your life, man, nothing would stop you. You'd just go forward. See... <laughs> The reason it's not about God's kingdom is because you're afraid that his kingdom will end. And the opposite is true. See, that's why some of you have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. Just in case the kingdom of God's not real, you've built up some nice storage for yourself on the kingdom of earth. James calls that a double-minded man who should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. It's not about your power. It's not about your kingdom. Blaise Pascal said, Lord, help me to do great things as though they were little since I do them with your power and little things as though they were great since I do them in your name. So life is not about your kingdom and life is not about your power. So can I ask you something? Whose power is it that will overcome the enemies in your life? Whose power will defeat your anxiety and depression? Whose power will heal your marriage? Whose power will overcome your addiction to pornography? Whose power will bring the prodigal son home? The Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man releases God's divine energy. You say, Chad, Jeff, I just don't know what that means. Okay, here's the last part of that puzzle. With the supernatural calling of God comes the supernatural power of God to give you the supernatural wisdom of God to defeat the giants in your life. See, what you want, what you want is for God to zap you. You want to pray? Boom! Oh, I'm better now. No, uh, no, 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 no. Why wouldn't God do that? Uh, let's go back to the Midianites and Gideon. Why did God even need Israel to defeat the Midianites? Why didn't God just zap the Midianites? Problem solved. Go on with your life. You have to ask this. Why? Because there's too much good to be done while you're fighting. Oh, yeah. While you're fighting. Oh, God's got your attention. He's got you calling him names. He's got you walking away and getting moody. I love you. I don't love you. I love you. I don't love you. 
He's got you on an emotional roller coaster. And he, David did the same thing. Why do you, why so downcast? Oh, my soul. Oh, yeah, put my hope in God. Up and down and up and down. That's your life. It's too great an advantage for God to take you through this tension. But the reality is, it's going to reveal whether or not he has your heart or not. Because if you walk away from him, that just proves who you were all the way from the beginning. But ultimately, you run to him, it proves that you really do believe it's about his kingdom and his power. I said before, God owns you. Do you know what I mean by that? Your life is not yours. From the moment you're born to the moment you die, you exist for God's glory. Now, let me show you how that last part works. This is important. So let's say on the count of three, life is not about my glory. So with the supernatural power of God comes the supernatural wisdom of God so that when you're in a quandary, the best thing you can do is pray and the best prayer you can pray is, God, show me the next step and I'll take it every 24 hours. See, you want to zap. You want God to, and you're done. No, 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 no. Now sometimes, but very rarely, there's a journey and here's why. It's the journey that brings God the glory. I want to go over to Ephesians chapter 2. Here's what the Bible says. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Now, you see that little phrase, incomparable riches? The Greek word for that is the word we use in English for trophies. You and your life is a trophy in the trophy case of God so that generations present and in the future can witness the surpassing glory of God. You know what that means? It means that God's going to do whatever he needs to do in your life to glorify himself. So that when people look at what God did in you, they're not going to say, wow, Jeff, you're awesome. No, they're going to say, wow, Jeff, God is awesome to do what he's done for the loser like you. You with me? It's amazing, this this idea of the glory of God, and we're the trophies of God, and then our difficult times in life, they're all inextricably tied together, because you really can't know the power of God unless you're in a situation where you need the power of God. I mean, if your life is cream cheese and easy, and you don't need God, I'm not sure you're ever going to grow close to God. You tend to grow close to people who've come in and involved themselves in your life in a way that you know there's no way you could have won this victory without the power, the presence, the knowledge, the wisdom of God so that you get older in life. You look back, man, I remember what God did when I was there. So what can he do now? Do you understand that? It's all an equipping ground. God takes you through things so that your faith grows so that the next time you hit something hard, and it might even be the ultimate calling on your life, God's got to prepare you. So that's why life is tough when you're young. He's hoping you'll learn the lesson while you're young so that when you get older, he can do something amazing, immeasurably more than you could ever hope for, ask for, or imagine. So if you think it's a sign of God's love that your life is easy, it's more a sign of God's love when your life gets difficult. And you run to him and he reveals himself to you, gives you that Jesus revelation that now you know, man, the Bible's right. Everything on this earth is really shakable. (laughs) My house, my car, my friends, really the only thing I depend on eternally is God himself. Greg Levoy says, I love this. He says, Jesus promised those who would follow him only three things, that they would be absurdly happy, entirely fearless, and always in trouble. And that's why James 1 says, count it all joy when you go through various trials because you'll be made perfect, complete. The Greek word for trials is the word periosmos, when it's not using plipsis. And those two words both come out of the wine press where you're stomping on the grapes and squeezing them till the good stuff comes out. That's what God's doing to you right now. And it hurts. But let him keep stomping. And you keep running, and eventually he'll squeeze you to the point the good stuff comes out. Now, here's the end. It's the real end. No fake ends this weekend. This is the real end. 
It comes down to, and I, let's not trace the etymology of these words, but let's just cut right to the chase. It comes down, are you going to be a microscope for God or a telescope? Okay. A microscope takes something that is small and makes it appear larger, right? But God doesn't need to be made to appear larger, and he's not small. Are you going to be a telescope? A telescope takes something that's far away and brings it near. The best way for God to appear close to those who are far from him is in the way you respond to the trials of your life. No sermon will ever speak the words that this young girl down here has spoken through the loss of her son. No sermon will ever speak like the testimony and life of my wife when we lost our first child. And no sermon will ever say what you will say in your life when you keep facing this giant and you cut the lag time between when you're in trouble and when you go to God and you drop to your knees and you say this to God. It's not about my kingdom, about yours. Not about my power, it's about yours. Not about my glory, but about yours. So whatever you need to do in my life to make these a reality, here I am, God. Now, I will tell you, sometimes I do catch myself saying to God, be gentle. Okay, but be gentle. I'm only human here. I'm only in the flesh. Don't give up. So here's your final exam. Number one, is it really about God's kingdom in your life? If it's really about God's kingdom, which proves you're the genuine article, then you are presently rearranging your life to give the very best of everything you have to him. The very best. Not the last, not the leftover, but the very best. The very best of your thought goes to God. The very best of your time goes to God. The very best of your resources go to God. So you might be building big houses and live in nice communities. There's no wrong in that. But ultimately, if you compare that with the time and the thought and the resources on the kingdom of God, it'd be incomparable. Is it about God's power? And if your life is about the power of God, then you are cutting the lag time between when you are in trouble and when you first drop to your knees and get God involved. And if it's really about God's glory, then you are finding yourself less and less uh, disturbed, <laughs> resentful, and strifeful, and more at peace with God recognizing your whole life as a journey so that others can see what God did in you. And that's when you know it's about God's kingdom, God's power, and God's glory forever and ever. Amen. Father, thank you for the power of your word, and I thank you in Christ's name for the power of the Lord's prayer. I pray that we would see a father who really does love us, whose kingdom is coming, whether or not we invite it in, it, it is coming. But I pray that we would be the kind of people who will drop to our knees in humility. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. May we be humble, poor in spirit, and allow you to do what you need to do in us and through us, demonstrating your power in us, glorifying your name through us and building your kingdom in all the resources you've given. And I pray that we would recall and remember how beautiful your name truly is. For yours is the kingdom, you're the power, and yours is the glory forever and ever. Amen. You've been listening to Today with Jeff Vines. Next time, we'll bring you a new message from Pastor Jeff. You can listen to more messages like this. Just search for Today with Jeff Vines wherever you get your podcasts. Today. 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 
Today with Jeff Vines. This is a production by One and All Media. For more, head to oneandall.media.